Thank you so much. That uh, song that Chris Bowater just sang means a lot to me. And uh, the reason it means a lot to me is that he wrote it for me and uh, sang it at my induction as World Ministries Director, sang it prophetically over our lives. And so it means an incredible amount. I uh, rang Chris a couple of days ago, just asked him how he was doing and things like that, and asked him for permission to play it publicly. And he said it would be an absolute honor. Um, I actually would like to be invited one day. Okay, that wouldn't be bad, would it? Have Chris do a concert for you or do a session. Because I don't know anybody who can minister God's grace and love in the same kind of passion and way that Chris has done over the years. Incredible blessing, along with a whole cohort of that era in the late 70s where God seemed to be bringing in a new wave of, of worship in a different sense, in a different model. And uh, that was beautiful. And Chris sent his love to you all, okay? Um, and asked me to convey his love to you at this time. He's struggling with his own health. We're all going old. Uh, time's moving on, isn't it? And that, that's something. The passage of scripture that we've, that we've just had read to us makes something of an assumption that we preachers kind of take for granted. And that is that when we come into a Pentecostal church, people are Pentecostal. So we preach with an assumption that everybody's filled with the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that, and who's leading tonight, by the way, in Hartlepool? Are you leading? Yeah. I, I had had a thought that tonight, I'm talking now, forget you for a lot, forget this. Why don't, why don't we do a question and answer tonight? Why don't we do a history where you ask me some questions and we, we do a lifestyle? So we do that, do a lifestyle night. And then when people come along, they can ask questions and we'll, we'll do a question and answer night. Okay, and do it as a, a, an evening with Dave and Madeline. Okay, she didn't even know that. So, it's a, so why, don't, why don't we do something like that tonight? And that would be a very, very, <clears throat> a very special evening, I'm absolutely sure. And because of that, what I was going to speak on tonight, um, and, and I don't feel I should do that, I just want to highlight it this morning, and that is that Paul went to Ephesus and had an assumption when he saw the congregation that everything was okay. But actually, he said, have you been filled with the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we haven't even heard of the Holy Spirit. Well, what were you baptized to? Oh, we were baptized in John's baptism. Well, that's what Jesus was baptized with, wasn't it? Surely that's okay. No, actually, we are baptized in the name of Jesus. Jesus was baptized with John on the baptism of repentance. A totally different issue. We're baptized when we're baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So Paul goes to this group of people assuming that everything's okay. When Peter goes to Joppa, he's being called to Joppa and... He sees righteous people, he sees people who pray, he sees people who are involved in church, he sees a, a vibrant church. But as he begins to preach, the Holy Spirit falls on them and they get saved. So they've got a whole group of people who are doing good things, holding church, part of church, involved in church, and yet actually aren't even believers in Christ, let alone filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you see what I'm saying? And, and then when Paul goes down to the river and meets Lydia, they, they've, they've got this immense prayer meeting going off. You know, they're, they're, they're more passionate than you and I in prayer. And yet Paul sees that actually there's a lady who opens her heart and then opens, she opens her ears and opens her heart and then opens her home. And, and there's a church. And, and we have a book to Philippi. We have a book to Ephesians. All because he didn't make the assumption that everything's okay because they're meeting in church. He didn't make the assumption that there didn't need to be some correction. He didn't make the assumption that there didn't need to be instruction in the Holy Spirit. And so when we read this classic passage of Scripture um, for Pentecostals, 
and we come to a Pentecostal church, there is an absolute assumption that when I'm talking about sending you into all the world to preach the gospel, and we're talking about um, mission possible, and that's been your subject over these last few weeks, we're speaking about mission possible, we're, we're saying mission possible if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Because if we're not filled with the Holy Spirit, we cannot do it in our own strength. I want to tell you, had Madeline and myself not been filled with the Holy Spirit in Japan, we would have struggled. We needed God's help. Fifteen and a half hours in the air is a long way for old people, isn't it? You know, it's, it's a tough flight. And, uh, and then landing there and, and doing what we had to do and, and, and landing into a culture that we... We've never really, I mean, we've been to Japan on four occasions now, but, but never really got into the, into the culture of it all. We've, we'd always been on a superficial level. But this time we were dragged into the depth of, uh, of the lack of spirituality of a whole community where you couldn't even talk to people about the basics you know where Paul could go to, where Paul could go to um, Mars Hill and see all the gods when he was speaking to the Greeks, and, and at least there was one there where he could say, "Well, I know you worship all these gods, but I want to declare to you the unknown God." But actually, speaking to a people who don't have a concept of God was a brand new learning curve. Uh, and I actually say I learned an incredible amount from the Japanese people that I spoke to, even more than the missionaries. Because it's true, isn't it? I, I, I wasn't talking about this, but anyway, I'm going to talk about something. But it is important that we understand that when we're reaching out to different cultures, we're reaching into stuff that we, we're in the unknown. And we have to rely on the Holy Spirit to enable us to, to be able to communicate in ways that, that are not normal to us. Uh, and the older we get, the harder that gets. And so we need to, we need to be able to understand something of, of God's grace and God's power in our, in our hearts and lives. But I, I, we were going to have a baptismal service, you see, and I was going to be speaking in this baptismal service in a few days hence. In fact, last Sunday, it was baptismal service in Japan. <laughs> And here we are in Billingham today. It seems crazy, doesn't it? That, that, you, that can be, that, that, can be that, that kind of way. But so I was speaking to the concierge in the hotel and said to him, what are the rites of passage for Japanese people? He said, I don't understand what you mean. And so I said, well, when you, when you have a baby, what do you do? Because I said, in England, people generally go and christen their babies or they, or they dedicate their babies. And he said, oh, no, no, we don't do anything like that. Said, After three days, we just take them to this shrine, hope they get some good luck and come back. And I said, but, so that's it? He said, yeah, he said, because we don't... In Shinto, there's no God. In Shinto, there's no holy books. In Shinto, there isn't even a, a faith leader. Isn't that interesting? So most religions and things like that, you can actually say Muhammad's wrong or Confucius is wrong or somebody else, but they don't have it. It's just, it's just a culture that's grown up within a culture and they haven't even got it. So to it, then for me to actually speak at a baptismal service without any context of any reason for baptism is tough, isn't it? So there had to be a full explanation and I'm glad we did what we did. Anyway, that's Japan out of the way in some respects. I want to get to the subject of what we're talking about then, and that is, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. That is kind of not a... When you read that passage of Scripture, and you read it over and over again, you kind of find that there's no option there. You will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Okay, so it's option free. It's not a case of saying, oh, well, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I can kind of do as I like. Actually, one of the outworkings of being filled with the Holy Spirit is that we become witnesses throughout the globe. Okay, that, that is the conditions that we're given on receiving the Holy Spirit. And if you don't 
kind of want to do that, then don't even ask for the Holy Spirit because it, it comes along, it's the package of us, of us touching a lost world because we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I haven't got time to go into everything, and neither did I want to today, but I, I wanted to touch Jerusalem and... and with what's happening in Israel and all the stuff that's going off at this moment in time, the crucial thing is, you see, is that Jesus wanted Jerusalem to be changed. That was his passion. He said, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit after staying in Jerusalem, just stay in Jerusalem, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Because he knew that within 70 years, there wouldn't be a Jerusalem. They'd only got a lifetime. My lifetime, in fact, I've lived longer than that statement was made by Jesus to go and save Jerusalem. Because actually, if we don't save Jerusalem, they're in trouble. Absolute trouble. And the trouble has continued down through the centuries because Jerusalem wasn't won. Isn't that tragic? You see, he came to his own and his own received him not, but to as many as did receive him, he gave them the power to become the sons of God. Now, every time I've heard this passage of Scripture preached on, uh, and, and, and it was this passage of Scripture that radically changed my life from being a local pastor into being a world thinker. Something had to happen because I, I loved local church pastoring, planting and things like that. And when Ron Hibbert actually challenged me prophetically that there was a lost world that God wanted me to change in small ways, I kind of resisted what he had to say. And he said, eventually you're going to have to submit because God's got a plan for your life to change the world, not change a village. And that's a big thing over a little village lad. Because I'd never travelled. In fact, the first time I'd ever travelled, I had to get a passport to travel with Clift and nearly kill myself so that Paul could save me. <laughs> Wondering how they're going to tell Madeline he's dead. You know, that. <laughs> it's true, we went to Israel. I didn't even got a passport before that day. And, and off, off we went into, the, into that very place. And, and, and God did something in my heart to begin to realize that we have to do something. And so I looked at this passage of Scripture and I began to look at the Great Commission and looked at it and looked at it and looked at it and looked at it until I was bored at looking at it and yet infused by it. And every time I heard it spoken, it was local, national, international, the world. And Jerusalem's the local and Jerusalem is not local. It's three days away from where these guys live. Stay in Jerusalem until you receive power from the, the Holy Spirit and you will become my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, they would, go, they would have gone home after Jesus died. A three-day journey up to Galilee, they'd have gone home. But no, you, we, we've got to take Jerusalem because Jerusalem is the capital Jerusalem is the capital city, and, and we have to take capital cities. And, and Islam said to us some while ago, if we can take London, we can take the world. We can take the world. The world can be taken if only we can convince London that Islam is the best way. London has such an effect across the world that actually we can change the world through its commerce, through its understanding. So what I wanted to speak about this morning was this. Isn't it interesting that in our nation, in London, in our capital, that all the decision making is in London. In fact, there is a, there is a, a balance within us or, or an anger within us sometimes that we live so far away that actually their decisions have nothing to do with our lifestyle. We feel a bit lonely. In fact, 
We want independence for the North East sometimes, don't we? You know that? And, and Scotland feels the same, and Ireland feels the same, and sometimes Wales feels the same. And so they've, they've tried for this independent spirit simply because they don't want to be controlled by London, but actually London controls, no matter what happens. And is it interesting that those who control us are called ministers? Isn't it? The prime minister. The minister who's the foreign minister, the home minister for home affairs. The minister who looks after education, the minister who looks after health, the minister who looks after... And they're called ministers. And, and round, it was round about 1940, just, just after the First World War, that someone made a statement that was the most unbalanced statement that has ever been made and actually has affected the church greatly, and it's this, that politics and religion don't mix. Now, I have got a Bible that is absolutely full of politics and religion. In fact, religion affected politics all the way through the Old Testament. God was totally involved in the politics of the nation of Israel. And Islam kind of carries the same kind of thing, you know, because they're both children of Abraham. And the sons of Abraham are actually um, ruled by theology. Even though they have different ideologies and different theologies, it, it's, it's done that God interferes in the affairs of men and women. Actually, if he gets in control and dictates the circumstance, then the nation can either have success or failure. Because when God's in control, he makes a difference. The Minister of Business and Trade... The Minister of Culture and Media and Art, there's a Minister of Education, there's a Minister of Security, there's a Minister that's Environment and Food, there's a Minister for Transport, there's a Minister for Work and Business, there's a Minister for Health and Social Care, there's a Minister for Defence, there's a Minister for Housing. I've got a feeling that even though many of us will probably not get into the Houses of Parliament or, or get into that, some of us should be thinking about it filled with the Holy Spirit and actually thinking about getting involved in some of these affairs and that if the Holy Spirit is actually on our lives and we are filled with the power of God we should be affecting the nation rather than some of the minority groups that we're really upset about that are affecting the nation okay I'm getting really tired of some of the stuff that comes on TV that of the stuff that's thrown at us all the time all the time and Christians are not there and the reason Christians are not there is because we don't get involved what we've done is stood back and allowed it to happen and that's an absolute tragedy you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and making a difference in different ways somebody rang me around about six months ago and said to me Dave there's an opportunity for you to uh, be involved in in Durham education they want you to be on the on the board that organises a curriculum for religious education in schools. Would you be interested? And I said, you bet I would. And my first meeting is next month. That's great, isn't it? I'm 75 years old. I shouldn't be the one who's there, actually. Some other people, but I'm not going to say no and not have the opportunity, even if I mentor someone else into position, so that they come and actually take that role because we should be involved in these kind of aspects of life, changing our nation. God wants us to be godly people in a nation that changes the nation, that, that somehow that being filled with the Holy Spirit is not just singing songs in church and enjoying our time of fellowship together, but grabbing some of these issues. I wonder who could actually get involved in business and trade. Maybe you need to talk to Ian Green. And somebody like that who understands something of, of the concept of, of business in, in mission. And that we get involved in culture and media and art. Isn't it important that, that we have good godly people in, in the sense of media? 
And we have godly people who are changing the world. You see, it's mission possible if we begin to go grab hold of what the reality of living life is about. And that we deal with those things. Education, wow, look at the opportunity. It's not many, I don't know how involved some of you younger ones are in schools nowadays. What we say is, is they don't run assemblies in schools. I know several headmasters and teachers who are struggling with their kids and they need spiritual input and pastoral care in, in education nowadays. And we need to begin again to offer ourselves for for stuff in school and helping with the curriculum and saying we can bring something to the kids because the kids are being robbed from our church. Where are the young people? We need the environment. Do you know the, 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 the whole planet has gone mad over the environment of, of Greenhouse gases and things like that and global warming. People are interested in the environment. Often the church is not interested in the environment when God's massively interested in the environment. He created the environment, this whole planet. And we need to begin to get interested in, in certain things that, that God's spirit in our life makes us useful, not too heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. People like you can bring a change. And, and if we're not bringing a change, then we're not really filled with the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit enables us to bring a change into every aspect of life. Some of us need to get involved in some secular stuff to bring spirituality into a secular world. And to change it and to be massively changed. Jerusalem. This is our Jerusalem. Our own capital is our Jerusalem. And if we don't want, in our nation, some of the horrors that have taken place in the Middle East, then we need Jesus. We need Jesus. Because I tell you, what's happening in the Middle East is going to become worldwide if we're not careful. Scripture tells us it is. You see... We can't divorce ourselves. We flew to Japan in 13 and a half hours. We came back from Japan in 15 and a half hours because of what was happening in the Middle East and in Russia and Ukraine. Because we had to fly around in case our plane got shot down. Okay? So a 50, an extra two hours in the air was to save us from the possibility of not arriving. You see, what's happening there can happen here if we shut our eyes to Jesus. See, we're not playing a game at singing a few songs and enjoying church. Somehow this is crucial for world evangelization and for God to come to a glorious church where we need to begin to affect society in, in a way like no one else is affecting it or like the gay society are affecting it or, or, or the people who are uh, off beam are affecting it. Other cults, one of the things Madeline didn't say about Japan and, and it was an important issue in some respects is that the cults have gone into Japan because they recognize that these people know nothing of God. We can teach them our errors and they'll follow our ways because they think it's truth. How, how ironic is that? That they have gone and we've stayed. It happened in Eastern Europe where the pornographers went in. When the, when the Berlin Wall came down, the pornographers went in, the cults went in, and the church was still singing its songs. How tragic. You have received power because the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Now, will you be my witnesses? I'm not asking you to go to Japan. I'm asking you to pray for London. I'm asking you to pray for the decisions that are being made across our nation because we're running headlong into the judgment of God rather than the blessing of God. And if we don't do something, as Mr. Gorbachev said, if not me, who? And if not now, when? 
But I'll tell you something, I don't know if I've got another 10 years. If I have, then it's his. And I'll do it, and we'll go for it, and we'll go for it, and we'll go for it. Because we have a passion to see that dream that was birthed in our heart and to see God do something absolutely amazing. I'm asking you today, please, 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 listen to what Luke and the team are trying to say. Mission is possible. We're in mission possible, but it's only possible if you do it. Amen.